Orion, welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me, Mark. It's really great to be here. Great to see you again. I was thinking of doing something different this time. I'm going to throw some quotes at you, some of them well-known quotes from famous people, just to start a conversation and see where, see where it leads us. Sounds fun. I'll do my best. So the first quote is from Marianne Williamson of the uh, Course in Miracles books. Maturity includes the recognition that no one is going to see anything in us that we don't see in ourselves. I think there's some truth to that. I am edging away from it given the superlative, anything. I think it's certainly possible that people can see things in us that we haven't yet discovered in ourselves. In fact, that's part of what makes relationships important. We learn about ourselves in relation to others. This starts from the very earliest age in the rapport between an infant and the mother. Like the infant doesn't even know that it is biologically or psychologically separate from the mother until maybe 12 or 15 months. We learn about ourselves in relationship to others because different people organically pull different parts of ourselves to the forefront while other parts of us recede into the background. That's why we tend to be different people around different people. It isn't because we're lying necessarily, though some people can lie. It's not because we're play acting or trying to be that way. It's just people naturally, some people make us feel calm, some people make us feel on edge, some people make us feel playful. And it's through that dynamic that we discover those aspects of ourselves. So I do think that it's possible for other people to reveal parts of ourselves that we haven't yet fully appreciated. That said, I think the core of what she's saying is is true, which is you shouldn't really be surprised by an observation another person makes about you, especially a negative observation. And I think this speaks to the importance of doing what you might call shadow work. Shadow work is the process of looking inward and appreciating that there might be irrevocable darkness inside of you. That all human beings are capable under certain circumstances of all kinds of different things. I've learned a lot about this in doing therapy. Like it's, I can't remember a time in over a decade where I've sat down with somebody and they've told me about something that they've gone through and I couldn't say I know what that feels like. And that's difficult because people are subject to all kinds of negative emotions and all kinds of destructive behaviors. But I think what happens when people don't look inward and accept that there is at least that capacity for evil or darkness inside of them, even if it's not being actualized, as long as if they don't see that capacity, they're subject to denying it and disavowing it which doesn't actually eliminate that darkness. It's more likely to come up. It's more likely to come up under the guise of identification in others, in so much as those disavowed aspects of self don't really get integrated into the personality. That's only possible through the acceptance and the processing and the shadow work. What they do is they tend to get projected into other people or onto other people, and then the folks who haven't fully integrated and accepted themselves then seek to eradicate their own projected darkness by trying to destroy the object onto which that darkness was projected. And that's ultimately the source of the lion's share of unnecessary suffering on this planet, is people trying to purge the world of their own projected darkness. And it's easy to say what the solution is. Well, the solution is to look inward and say, well, you know, he who out without sin cast the first stone kind of a thing. Like, are you really that pure? Are you really that good? Are you really that righteous? And to deeply accept with humility your own limitations and propensities for darkness, and that actually keeps you safe. It's the people who don't think that they can do any harm or can do any wrong that are often so convicted into the righteousness of their own perspectives that they create a lot of a lot of suffering for others in the world. So that's what I got for that quote. Mm -hmm. That's good. This is a quote by Joseph Campbell. 
I don't believe people are looking for the meaning of life as much as they are looking for the experience of being alive. I wonder if they're the same. So when I was younger, I was very much obsessed with finding the meaning of life as if it was something concrete and objective that was hidden out in the world. And it was for me, the sincere seeker to go out and find it like an adventurer trying to discover a lost continent or something like that. One of the things I learned about that is that seeking propensity took me all over the world and brought me into contact with many different kinds of people from many different cultures. And I had a plethora of different experiences and I still never found the meaning of life. One of the things that I discovered is that when you're seeking, you're seeking. That is to say, when you're seeking, you're not finding. When you're seeking, you're seeking. When you're finding, you're finding. On some level, perpetual seekers are like hopeless romantics. They're playing this game of hide and seek with themselves on some level, or let's say an aspect of their own disavowed divinity. They're taking that and they're hiding it out into the world. And that actually invests the world with this sort of romantic sense of adventure. Like there's some real positive good out there that exists that is just waiting to be found and it's findable and I could potentially find it, which creates this sort of passionate intensity, even if it's full of suffering and struggle and delayed gratification, that game of hide and seek can invest life with more meaning. And that's why a lot of people do it. But ultimately, again, if you're seeking, you're seeking. On, at some point, I made the decision to stop seeking and start finding. And what that on some level means is that if, I kind of approach this from the perspective of like, if there is a meaning to life, it can't be located in any one particular place. Like that wouldn't be fair. So many people would never come to that place. And so that would suggest that the meaning of life was just access, inaccessible to the vast majority of people. And it can't be located at a specific point in time for the same reason. So if there is a meaning to life, it needs to be experienced or approachable at any given place at any given time, which means I can do it right here and now. So I don't need to start, I, I don't need to keep seeking. I can start finding right now, right where I'm at. And that was a shift in perspective in my life where rather than seeing it as something that was out there that I was missing, it was something that was right in front of me that I could come into greater awareness and direct emotional experience with. Does that make sense? Now, the quote was about the meaning of life and the experience of life. So I made an episode about this. It was called The Meaning of Life, I think. Maybe this is why you're asking me the question. <laughs> it is. I know your channel well. Okay. So one way to approach the meaning of life is <laughs> that life is sort of like Disneyland, where we all get to go into the park and have all kinds of different experiences. There are rides and concessions and lines, and there's kind of no right way to do Disneyland. Like the person who decides I'm gonna ride every single ride once, like that person didn't do Disneyland right. He didn't win Disneyland, you know what I'm saying? The person who rode the teacups 50 times, that person didn't do it wrong. That person didn't lose Disneyland. And the person who didn't go on any rides at all for whatever reason, or just stood in line, you know, that was their experience of Disneyland. And on some level, we get to choose what experiences we have in the park within certain objective constraints, like maybe some rides are inoperable the day we go. Can't do it. Or maybe I could ride this ride, but it means I'm gonna have to wait in line for four hours, which is going to severely restrict my ability to ride other rides. It's like, you have to make those decisions. And it, those decisions are constrained by objective reality of your circumstances, right? But at the end of the day, everyone has their one day in Disneyland, and then we go home. And that's what it was. Like, 
if you rode the teacups 50 times, then the meaning of your life was that. Like that was your time in the park. And we discover in retrospect the meaning of our life by examining the choices that we make as we move through time. I think that's right, which generally means that we can't noodle out the meaning of our lives alone in our room. It's not a cognitive decision. It's a retroactive emotional appreciation for the decisions that we made and how we spent our necessarily limited amount of time. And there's no right or wrong way to live. I know that can sometimes rub people the wrong way, but moral judgments like right or wrong are only really appropriate in the context of either an extrapolated moral ethical framework or a particular goal. The easiest way to approach that is, which is better, the mountains or the beach? Well, it depends on your goals. Like if you wanna go skiing, you should not go to the beach, right? That's the wrong choice, but only in the context of that goal. Like the mountains have their pros and cons and the beach has their pros and cons. And at the end of the day, if you go right or you go left, you still go somewhere. And that's your life, is where you go. This is one of my favorite quotes from a professional wrestler named Eddie Guerrero, who has now passed away. If you're not cheating, you're not trying. <laughs> I think it applies to everything. Business, relationships, everything. Oh yeah, so this will be a tough one too. Um, <clears throat> So life is a nested series of games. We're all playing many different games simultaneously, whether we're aware of it or not. Game can sometimes rub people the wrong way, but I define a game as anything with a goal and a set of rules. What that means is that every game is defined by what you can and cannot do. Otherwise, it's not a game, it's just chaos, like anything goes. That's not a game, that's disorder. Which means that inherently, fouling is a part of every game. A game that can't, where fouling is not possible is a game that has no rules, which is not a game, it's chaos, right? Fouling is part of the game. Imagine being, let's say, a, a basketball player and trying to play at the highest levels without ever committing a personal foul. It would not be possible. It would not be possible because you would be inappropriately handicapping yourself in ways that your competitors were not, and you would have to be so significantly better than them in terms of your ability to compensate for that arbitrary self-handicap. And you won't be that significantly better because at the highest echelons of performance, there are smaller and smaller margins. The competition is so stiff. It's so stiff. The slightest bit of edge, and maybe that involves cheating sometimes, or something close to it, gives you the edge. Well, sure, it's like, you know, maybe in a, a foot race, the diff distance between uh, like a Usain Bolt and probably the, the 500th fastest man in the world is probably like, a couple tenths of a second at most. So like as you near the top spot, you it's like approaching the speed of light. You need to do expend more and more of an effort to actually produce smaller and smaller gains. And so a person who handicapped themselves in that way would not be able to compete at that level. They might compete successfully at a lower level, but not at the highest echelons. And so the reality is that cheating, or let's say rule infractions, are a calculated risk. And there are certainly times in games where the potential penalty associated with infringing this rule is offset by the likely projected gain associated with doing so or the loss associated with not doing so. You can approach it that way. Excellent. The next quote is about risk. This is from Jim Rohn, the uh, entrepreneur and author. If you're not willing to risk the unusual, you're going to have to settle for the ordinary. 
Well, yeah. If you just do what everybody does, you get what everybody has. Yeah, that makes complete sense to me. So that means in order to be extraordinary, you have to be willing to deviate, often in significant ways, from normative behavior and values, which generally means that you become less aligned with the people immediately around you. I made an episode that just came out about this, which is the cost of living your own life. The cost of living your own life is the acceptance of others. You can't both be accepted by others and to live your own best life. Like the two things are not possible. Why? Because the normative conventions are like buying clothes off the rack. Like they're only gonna fit you to a certain extent. If you want a life that is really built towards your preferences and talents and skills, it has to be custom tailored, which means that you're going to have to change or build from the ground up a completely new fabric for your life. And that's very difficult for people to do. It becomes very lonely. Like we, I think, often inappropriately believe that we could tolerate social disapproval, especially at the level that it's capable of attaining in today's day and age. There's this really interesting study that was done a long time ago. It's so simple. Like, there are no rules about how you stand on an elevator. Like, there are no laws about that. But everyone stands the same way. So there was a psychological study that was done a while ago where they put like four Confederates in an elevator and had them face backwards, right? And the unknowing participant in the study, who didn't know that this was what was being studied, he thought or she thought they were on their way to uh, the actual study. The elevator opens, the people are facing the back, and the researchers are trying to observe what the person does in that circumstance. And the vast majority of people would turn around and face backwards. Like there's so many examples of conformity research that we know that it's very hard for a person to deviate even from a consensus of three or four individuals. It's very, very difficult. Like there's that old movie, 12 Angry Men. Did you, did you ever seen that? Mm -hmm. Classic courtroom drama with Henry Fonda. It takes place in this one room. There are a jury deliberating the sentence or the verdict of a, a youth accused of murder. In the beginning of the movie, Fonda is the only juror who believes the guy might be not guilty. And over the course of the next two hours, he slowly kind of works to convince the other jurors of the reasonable doubt in the case. And that movie, even you know, 70 years later, is held out as an example of an individual who has the strength of conviction to stand up to the majority. And all he did was stand up to 11 people. But that's hard enough. Now, imagine you live in a society where you might have to stand up in front of 11 million people who disagree with you and also might disagree with you with anonymity and impunity, which often takes the restraint off of their views. You're talking about social media. All kinds of social media, right? Like, we know that when people are able to make anonymous comments, they become more extreme in their language and in their views, because what's the accountability structure here? So if it's hard, if we celebrate the courage and strength of Henry Fonda standing up to 11 people, imagine how much courage and conviction you have to have to be able to stand up to 11 million people, also in a day and age where the consequences of deviating from the correct opinion at the moment can be significant. You could lose your friends. You can lose your livelihood. People are canceled. Uh, it's, it's actually a, a very concerning trend. So, but what's the alternative? The alternative is that you seek to fit in in order to avoid the risks of standing out. 
And unless you are a very conventional person, and some people are psychologically very conventional people, and they don't think there's anything strange or effortful about conforming because they were like built that way. They're conf they were built in alignment with conventional ideologies and structures. So they often can't understand why it's so difficult for other people who, for whatever reason, can't or won't conform in the way that they do. Um, but clearly there's also a lot of problems in our societies. Um, I think that if our society on the majority was thriving, was peaceful, was prosperous, you could make a better argument for conformity. But if you live in a society that might be unstable and polarized and fractious and hostile, I think conformity might be part of the problem. Here's another Jim Rohn quote. Don't wish it were easier. Wish you were better. Yeah, so many different ways you can go with this one. It's just having what it takes to excel, to be excellent, to stand out from everyone else. Oh, yeah. I think that's very true, and it's true on... I think it's about courage, hard work and courage. Well, the issue is that we actually don't want things to be that easy. This is going to sound strange, but what this quote actually makes me think of are is the video game series The Legend of Zelda. You ever played Zelda, Mark? Never. Okay. I like the video game series, The Legend of Zelda. It's one of these open world adventure games. You play Link, you got a sword, you got to get the seal, the shields, and you go into the temples and get the items to defeat the bosses and grow your hearts and save the princess. It's, it's a very actually Jungian um, hero's quest type of video game. It's the archetypal hero's quest video game. And if you go through the game, you eventually get to this state where you're functionally unbeatable, like you're unkillable. You have so many heart containers, you have all the most powerful weapons. Sometimes even the final boss is a piece of cake because you're so overpowered at that point. The game is no longer fun. Like, the game is more engaging when we could lose it still. When there was a chance that we might not have enough to succeed. When we didn't yet have that item that we needed in order to defeat that particular boss, and the fact that we didn't have it actually gave us the pretext for the adventure to get it. But now, once you have everything, and you're functionally invulnerable, and you can't ever die, and there is no reason to go anywhere else because you have everything already, well, what's the point of the game at that point? You know, that's not a fun game to play. So there has to be kind of appropriate challenge. When the game is too hard, whether it's a video game or the game of life, people are subject to just rage quitting. They might feel like this is a game that they can't possibly get enough good at to stand a decent likelihood of succeeding in. Okay, fair enough. But if it's too easy, people don't bother to play. Like, we want an appropriate level of challenge. And ultimately, that's kind of what life does for us organically. Like, life never really becomes easy if we're playing it right. If life becomes easy, it kind of means that we haven't moved on to the next temple. We haven't moved on to the next challenge. We're you know, sometimes this is an ego-based thing. Like, it can be more satisfying to stay in a class where you effortlessly ace every exam. But if that's the case, you're not learning anything anymore, right? Researchers have discovered that the optimal hit rate for machine learning algorithms is 85%, which basically means that they want to put new data in front of an algorithm and they want that algorithm to get it right 85% of the time and to make mistakes 15% of the time. Because if the algorithm is getting it right more than 85%, it's not learning anything. 
And so it's kind of wasting everybody's time because you're not training it to be any better than it already is. And if it's getting less than 85% correct, it's creating too much error and confusion. So it's counterproductive. So actually shooting for that 85% hit rate is the optimal learning strategy. And generally people are more engaged, they're more interested, they feel more alive when they're appropriately challenged when there's still that 15% that they haven't yet mastered. But because they have 85, they feel confident enough that they can meet that challenge. But if you're living life correctly, it's not that life ever gets easy, it's just that we get bigger and bigger bosses and harder and harder temples and more and more inaccessible items, which fortunately, thankfully provide us for the continued pretext for adventure and growth because otherwise it's just stagnation and decline. We want things to be comfortable, but then we want to be challenged. Generally, when people want things to be comfortable, it's because things are hard for them in that moment. It's like I talk to a lot of folks and sometimes they'll say, oh, Ryan, if I could just run away from everything and live on a beach and just drink out of a coconut, my life would be okay. I don't think that's true. I think that they could do that maybe for a few days, maybe a week at most, and then they're gonna get bored. But they're speaking out of their own exhaustion in the moment. So sometimes I tell people that you need to rest before you quit. Maybe your fantasy about running away or leaving it all behind is really just a function of the fact that you're tired right now. And when you rest, you'll have a much different relationship to whatever you're dealing with in your life. This is a quote from Winston Churchill. Oh, I love that guy. You have enemies, good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, a, a, a person who has no enemies has not stood for anything of interest to anyone. People sometimes think that only bad people have enemies. That's not true. Like some of the best, unfortunately, some of the best people throughout history that I'm aware of not only had enemies, but they were killed by their enemies. I mean, and I don't think that they attracted those enemies because their views were incorrect. So I don't think we should seek out having enemies. I, I think it might be a good practice to not have any enemies yourself, but to be comfortable being other people's enemy. Does that make sense? I don't want to be the, I don't want to see any human being as my enemy, but if other people choose to see me as their enemy, that's their choice. Franklin Roosevelt, courage is not the absence of fear. It's the assessment that something else is more important than fear. Yeah, he also said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, right? Which basically means that courage is just fear of a different sort. Potentially courage is the fear of being a coward. Courage is the fear of letting someone else down. Courage is the fear of a greater pain than you might experience by sticking your neck out. It's like you can use your fear to defeat your fear. You just have to be afraid of the right things. The Stoics talked about this a lot. They talk about it's beneath human dignity to be afraid of things they shouldn't be afraid of. And it is a unique human failing to not be afraid of things that they should be. That most people are basically not afraid of the right things. When you use fear appropriately, when you're not afraid of things that you shouldn't be afraid of, and when you are afraid of things that you should, then you have this sort of like dignity and courage to navigate through life with equanimity. One more Jim Rohn quote. Sure. There are two types of pain you will go through in life, the pain of discipline and the pain of regret. Discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs tons? Well, it's, it's definitely pain either way. Like there is no pain-free path. 
pain is an essential, irrevocable component of lived experience. The only way to not feel pain is to not be alive. So to my mind, what that means is it's a better idea not to make determinations about which path in life might be less painful because they might be equally painful, albeit in different ways. But to choose the path that takes you where you want to go. And if you choose the path that takes you where you want to go, it might redeem the pain that was required to experience in order to get there. I think that discipline is a form of pain. It's a, it's a emotional tantrum that discipline has to come in contact with. Discipline comes in contact with the parts of us that are still lazy, that are still selfish, that are still comfort oriented, that are still deceitful, that are still mm, spiteful. And when discipline says you can't do those things anymore, there is this little emotional tantrum that tends to erupt inside of people's minds and hearts. And I think tantrum is the appropriate word because I think it's related to the unbounded emotional narcissism of the child. I mean, children are all inherently narcissistic and they're hopefully disabused of that narcissism by appropriate parenting as they get older. But all of us arrive to adulthood without having been told no to some extent in some important way in our lives. And it might fall to us to say no to ourselves because who's gonna do it now? Who's gonna say no to you now? Like you won't even listen to your parents as an adult, most likely. So it's certainly not gonna be the postman or your neighbor or your wife. It's like you have to do it to yourself. You have to practice self-abnegation in the service of becoming I guess more mature, but that sounds so weak. Like it doesn't sound like a very juicy reward for having gone through all of that emotional pain. Discipline has the same root as disciple. I think it's the same word just pronounced differently, right? And a disciple is somebody who voluntarily submits to an order, usually a religious order, because he or she believes that that surrender is the best possible way of attaining a higher expression of being. And so it's a sacrifice of the lesser in a calculated risk to get what might be the greater. But that's difficult, man. That's tough. But that's actually the alchemy of spiritual transformation. People took the alchemical texts too literally, the transmutation of lead into gold. Uh, that's all symbolism. It's all a metaphor for personal spiritual transformation. We all start as lead, more or less, just dull material. But eventually, through certain processes of heat, which is like adding intensity, breaking things down, that's actually what happens when you melt something, right? Is that the energy dissipates the bonds between the molecules and they start to shift, which is a liquid. That breaking down is necessary to reconstitute the molecules in a different structure. It's to build something back up. Sometimes it's not possible to build without breaking. That's why sometimes breakdowns can become breakthroughs and you never really know what's gonna happen to people while they're still above ground, you know? So, the whole alchemical metaphor is about the spiritual transformation to become gold, which is you know, the attribute of the sun, which is divinity, which is light, which is beauty, which is effulgence. And that's something that at least theoretically is a pathway that's open to all human beings, but it's very difficult to understand. You might ask, well, Orion, why didn't they make it easier to understand? 
Like maybe more people would take that path if it was easier for people to know what the fuck to do. But it's very difficult to know what the fuck to do when you're working with symbols and metaphors, etc. The reason why is because you want to, these wise people, and I do think they were wise, were trying to speak in such a way that across time and across culture, as many different people can approach an understanding of these truths as possible, which probably means it can't follow a specific script. A specific script will never work all of the time. Imagine a military manual that just said, oh, always attack from the right. Like how easy would it be to defend and respond to that tactic, right? That would be a terrible suggestion. So in war, you can not you can have general precepts, but you can't ever say this is how you win a battle because as soon as you say that, it's no longer the way to win the battle. Do you understand? And so you do have to speak in general terms and have that fall to people's individual intelligences to interpret and apply them to their specific circumstances. It, it is helpful to have interpreters though. Like the I Ching is great and all, but I would be lost without like Carl Jung's interpretations of it. It's just too esoteric and culturally bound for my modern Western mentality. So I do need Jung who is able to kind of bridge the East and the West to m help me make more sense of some of those, um, those beliefs. It's interesting how many things happen in our lives that at first appear to be the worst thing that we can imagine and yet turn out to be one of the best things that have ever happened. Well, y yeah. I mean, one of the things that- <laughs> And vice versa. That's also true. That's also true. Be well, why is that? Because most people don't use the words good and bad in any kind of consistent way, like in the sense of having that relate to a objective moral or ethical framework. They don't. When people say good, it's associated with things they like and, and getting what they want. And when they say that something is bad, it's something they don't like and it's associated with not getting what they want or getting what they don't want, right? So most people's use of those of that moral language is actually based in their own egocentrism and self-relevant goals, okay? So because of that, people don't always, mm, how do we put this? It's like getting what you want isn't always getting what you need kind of a thing. And if we're too focused on getting what we want, we might be blind to how a given opportunity might actually serve us in the long run. Personally, one of my most precious experiences in life, it's gonna sound very strange, but it's my personal bottom, which I think about several times a week, probably not every day, but several times a week. And just like folks who go through recovery programs, it's like the memory of that moment when life had become unbearable. Like I reached a point where I literally could not, I didn't think I could keep living. And it's that, it's that moment, the, the, like the intensity of the pain that has kind of kept me on the straight and narrow and served as an inflection point for the beginning of everything improving in my life. Like fortunately, it, it never got worse than that. I guess if it did, it would, that would be the bottom, right? Bottom is where you stop digging. And thank God for that. Like if it hadn't gotten that bad, my life would be much worse today because it probably would have been more tolerable. And on some level, nothing is more, nothing is more unstable, unstable. Nothing is more unstable as misery. A miserable person is either going to succumb or do whatever is necessary to get out of the misery. And sometimes we have to arrive at the point of being willing to do whatever is necessary to escape our misery. Only then does the story of our life begin in earnest. Until then, it's just prelude. 
So sometimes the pain and the suffering that people are subject to experiencing, it's motivating them on a long enough time scale to enter into the narrative of their lives fully. Hmm. I guess that's what I'll say to that. This is probably my favorite quote from Thomas Friedman, the political commentator. Pessimists are usually right and optimists are usually wrong, but all the great changes have been accomplished by optimists. So I think this speaks to the importance of hope. Optimists have a vision for the future. They believe that things could be better than they are. And it's that hope that motivates the effort and the pain and the struggle of attempting to realize that in reality. So I think there's some truth to that. People need hope, and generally people need hope more than they realize. The thing about the being right, I, the first part of that quote I'd like to respond to, because it also speaks to this, this common understanding that is supported by some of the research that smarter people are more unhappy. Part of this is due to the phenomenon of a, a nosagnosia, which is a lack of knowledge about one's own lack of knowledge. It's like dumb people don't know that they're dumb, and so they don't understand their own limitations, and so might not be bound in some of the ways that people who are more intelligent or self-aware might be. And so I do think that there's this trope of people who think deeply, they tend to be more melancholy or depressed or pessimistic because they're seeing reality more accurately. There is some truth to that, but I don't think that's the whole truth. I think that if you're smart and you're still unhappy, you're not that smart. Like the primary, the principal function of your intelligence should be how to exist as a contented being in reality. If you haven't figured out how to do that yet, your intelligence is not that high as you think it is, or it's being applied to the wrong problems. The fundamental problem that intelligence is supposed to solve is how can I be a good and happy person? It's like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? So sometimes if you're gonna go down that path, you have to keep going. Like knowing a little bit might make you pessimistic, might make you depressed, might make you hopeless. Don't stop. You just have to keep learning. And the more your intelligence grows and the more you're able to apply that successfully to the problem of living, the happier, more joyful, and more contented and peaceful you'll become. Like the, the smartest people are not pessimistic. The smartest people are not depressed or hopeless because they found a way to solve the problems of their life with their intelligence. And really, what the fuck would be the point of being smart if you couldn't do that? This is a quote from G. Michael Hoff, the author, who uh, I, I've heard Joe Rogan mention this quote several times on his podcast. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. Makes sense to me. I mean, very pithy too. I think one way to approach this is that we as a species might be lazier, might be more prone to selfishness, might be more subject to the stultifying effects of comfort than we might realize. A lot of this has to do with the fact that those things generally weren't very available to the vast majority of individuals throughout history. And so we would take them when we could. It's sort of like why we have an obesity epidemic is because it was rare throughout most of human evolutionary history to encounter foods that were rich in fats or calories. And so there's this tendency to say, okay, well, I'll eat it now because who knows when the getting is gonna get this good again. And so there are these deep physiological and psychological mechanisms that predispose people to certain kinds of foods. And that's uh, you know, it's more complicated than that, but that is the vulnerability 
that leaves people susceptible to all kinds of problematic eating behaviors, right? So I think that we as a human species like to laze about. We like to feel pleasure. We like to not work hard because most of our lives throughout human evolutionary history has been effortful and full of toil and full of struggle and full of pain. And so maybe this is comparable. It's like, who knows when the getting is gonna get this good? Uh, why not just laze about? But it's interesting because what this suggests is that potentially humans are about as good as they need to be. And some of the romanticism about previous generations, who, uh, let's not take anything away from them, did wonderful and amazing and courageous things at times, but they also did so under the impulse of necessity. Like, even depressed people will escape a burning building. Even suicidally bedridden, psychotically depressed people will get up and walk out. Maybe they haven't got out of bed in months. Do you see? And what motivated them? Necessity. Necessity is a hard master. And we might need it in more ways than we appreciate. But this is, there's another dimension to this quote that's also interesting, which is, well, are people doing well now? Like we can certainly make the argument that people on the whole are not thriving. They are sick, both mentally and physically. They are struggling financially. They are struggling existentially with purpose and meaning. Relationships of all kinds are fragmenting. Like if this isn't a hard time, then what is a hard time? Like it has to be a war? It has to be a famine? Maybe it does. Maybe it does have to be that hard of a necessity. But clearly, it's not good times for a lot of people right now. So where are the strong men? I think there's two ways to approach this. One is that they're coming back. Like I do think that there is a turning of a tide that I've sensed very recently. Like I'm, I'm even cautious about saying that, but I do think that there is some waking up with respect to this and it's beginning to propagate throughout the general population. Okay, so I do think that we will see more strong men in the coming days, I believe that. But the second thing is, well, maybe folks, there's, there's, there's a trap. There are traps that exist today that ensnare people that didn't exist even a generation ago. And why do hard times create strong men? Because the hardness of those times creates pain which motivates people to do what is necessary to escape that pain, which generally means becoming stronger, more resilient, more competent, more bold. Like it's, it's to escape pain. But what we have now are a number of different ways to anesthetize pain. People can anesthetize pain today in ways that are, would just be science fiction even 20 years ago. People can anesthetize themselves with copious amounts of low-cost, high-fat, satisfying foods. They can anesthetize themselves with on-demand sexual variety on the internet. They can satiate themselves with one of dozens of streaming services offering hundreds of emotionally compelling series and dramas. They can anesthetize themselves even from their own experiences by doom scrolling, where they're so alienated from their own lived experience because they're just worrying about the climate or about the Middle East. And that's what occupies their consciousness to almost block out the pain and the discomfort they may be experiencing in their own subjective experience, right? And on and on and on. So the reason why we might not be seeing as many strong men coming out of these objectively hard times is because of these anesthetizing snares that exist and have succeeded in entrapping millions and millions of people. If they were somehow disabused of those strategies and came into more immediate emotional contact with the pain of their lived experience 
we would see a lot more strong men arise and strong women too. I don't think it's simply the virtue of men to be strong. But you have to come in contact with the pain, which nobody wants. Pain is the gift that nobody wants. But it's the necessity of reality to change and to grow and to evolve. It's like people who, for whatever reason, have like a congenital defect, which prevents them from experiencing pain subjectively, have a real rough time, Mark. Have you, have you heard about these people? They'll, they can chew off their own tongue. They can put their hand on a stove and not realize it and have third degree burns all over their hand. They'll never be able to use that hand again. Like they're covered in bruises and lacerations. That's a life without pain. So we, we have to use our anesthetizing principles very prudently and cautiously. Obviously, it's very good that anesthesia exists. Like I had a, I had a colleague who grew up in Ukraine who told me that he got his wisdom teeth out at 15 without anesthesia. Can you believe un anesthetized oral surgery on an adolescent? Like, wow, amazing. They're breaking bones and pulling teeth out. Oof. So I'm glad that anesthesia exists. Like it allows us to do th things that would be extremely excruciating or difficult to do otherwise, but it is absolutely over applied. Partly this also has to do with the fact that people don't know what else to do. There will create, it'll create this vacuum for a while. Like if you were to take away people's smartphones and pornography and the streaming services and alcohol and weed and all the different substances that people use to escape their own subjective experience, if only temporarily, well, what would they do instead? Like you'd have to actively create a space for nothing comparable to come in for quite some time. And why is this so difficult? Because people don't live in communities anymore. They don't exist among extended kin networks. They have more f fractious relationships. People have fewer relationships than they have ever, I think, throughout human history. I think there's a, 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 a significant number of Americans who don't have a single friend, a single friend. A lot. Like how awful would that be? So many people I've interviewed, I ask them if they have any friends and oh. they say no. That, that could, that's heartbreaking, you know? Because a friend is sort of like the ultimate good. If you have one friend, to go back to the conformity studies that we were talking about earlier, what these researchers found is that even with three or four confederates, it was very difficult for people to persist in their own perception of reality. But when the researchers introduced one confederate who agreed with the participant, it was so much easier. Like a person can stand up against a lot of people if they have one person who believes in them. But if they don't have that one person, they might not be able to stand up against one person. But if you have that one person, you might be able to stand up against a million. So the force multiplier of friendship is enormous. And what's the point of having all the other goods in life, riches and comforts and excitement and meaning if you can't share them with other people? Like how lonely would that be? I guess that's sort of the moral of the Midas myth, right? Is he had all of the wealth, he had the Midas touch, he turned everything into gold. But because of that, you know, he turned his wife into gold, he turned his food into gold. So he didn't, because of his heedless pursuit of riches, he cut off the potential of sharing it with anybody else and actually nurturing and sustaining him on a deeper level. But that's a problem, that's like a champagne problem, as they call it, you know what I'm saying? That's not the problem that affects most people. What affects most people is not having a friend or to have increasingly tenuous friendships. Like how many people in the last four years have had a friend cut them off or a family member 
turn their back on them or an employer let them go because of some of their beliefs during the recent events. It's like people have fewer relationships and those relationships seem more tenuous than they have ever been. It's a, a very difficult time. I guess the opportunity here is for people to cultivate greater self-reliance and resilience. I mean, that is potentially the silver lining. And whether people do, I think depends on whether they allow their pain to appropriately motivate them or they escape from their pain in one of the many freely and easily available anesthesias that our culture provides. It seems like everything in our lives, the place we live, the job we have, the career we choose, the friends we have, the romantic relationships, there's always a good aspect and a bad aspect to everything. There's always a trade-off. And it seems like technology, for all the great things it brings, all the convenience, all the, all the wonderful things technology brings, we rarely speak about the negative effects of technology. It's almost like there's a 50-50 trade-off, it seems. There's a price you pay and a benefit you reap. It's not always 50-50, but you're right. There is always a benefit and there's always a liability. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not 50-50, but, but there's always a trade-off. And with technology, look at all the great things it's brought. The library is now in the palm of your hand. Like everything is so much easier. But no one ever talks about the price we're paying for that. And I think the biggest hit has been courage, especially with mm. men. Look, look at how strong and tough people were 2,000 years ago. Just look at what the settlers coming from Europe to America had to overcome, just traveling across the United States. Well, you have to find a way or make a way. I mean, that's a quote from Hannibal. And, and now people don't, they complain about getting on an airplane because it's a hassle. Yeah, I mean, it's, it looks like a very different world. I, I can't imagine what- We seem very soft. I think we are very soft. And that's also an opportunity. It has never been easier in the history of the world to be hard. Yeah. It has never been easier in the history of the world to be courageous. Yeah. Now, one of the things I was gonna, that you spoke of, oh yeah, the library in your phone. This is really interesting because yeah, you have the entire more or less history of human knowledge at your fingertips. The the amassed collected works of all our greatest thinkers and artists available on your phone. Every book right here, but who reads? Maybe the fact that it's here at my fingertips that can be accessed at any time means that I don't really have to do that right now. The Greek, in Greek mythology, the gods envied man and they envied man because he was mortal, which is kind of a strange thought, right? And why did the gods envy man his mortality? Because his limited amount of time forced him to make choices that became meaningful in the context of that limitation. The gods had no meaning to their lives because they could do anything at any time eternally. And so there was also no need to do anything at any time eternally. Because of the shortness of our lives, we kind of have to make hay while the sun is shining. You know, we have to take action. We're the get shit done species, as it were. And it's that awareness of mortality that can be a gift. That's what it is in the Tolkien universe as well. When Eru Iluvatar, the great god in Tolkien's mythology, creates man and gives him mortality because he is his favorite creation. It's the same basic principle. It motivates action. And because we can do some things and not others, those things that we do, like intrinsically assume meaning. If we could do anything at any time, nothing is meaningful. And there's no necessity for action, so people don't act. So having things convenient is often at cross purposes to having things done. Sometimes things have to be a little inconvenient and a little difficult to, like I was saying with the video game, 
if it's, if it's too little of a challenge, people don't want to play. It's not fun. Oh, I do that later. There's so many better things I could be doing with my time. So we get rid of some of those obstructions, I think, to our own detriment. But we're all still learning. Like the pace of technology is insane. And no one's ever had to figure out these issues before. We're, we're figuring it out collectively in real time. Maybe we're doing a decent job of it. Like, and I think that we'll get better at it with time. I mean, no one really worries about typewriter ribbon jams anymore. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> True. Fun fact about typewriters. Yeah. Do you know where the QWERTY arrangement comes from? No. Do, don't you, did you ever think about like how they decided yeah, right. why, why, why the letters why went there? Not, oh, this this totally speaks to what we're talking about. Um, the first typewriters actually had the most commonly used English letters on the home row where your fingers rest in touch typing. They made the most commonly used letters more convenient for typists' fingers. It's a rational decision, right? But what the manufacturers found is because those letters were so convenient, they kept creating jams in the typewriter. You actually want to create some space between each subsequent type hit or else they get jammed and it's much less efficient in the long run. So they created the QWERTY arrangement to make certain letters more inconvenient for typists so that they could actually get more writing done. And our keyboards are a vestige of those typewriters. Obviously, it's not necessary to have the letters in that arrangement anymore for that reason, but people are already trained. Yeah. On this topic, there's one thing I've always told myself for decades is that hard work is my friend. <laughs> it's what helps me get ahead of everyone else around me. <laughs> but then my dad told me a dozen years ago that any jackass can work hard. They can. <laughs> you ready for the next one? Sure. This, this is from the Indian philosopher and writer, Rabindranath Tagore. Oh, I've read some of his work before. I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and behold, service was joy. So there's a good book called The Razor's Edge by W. Somerset Maugham. Do you know that book? Do you know the classic movie with Tyrone Power that it's based on? I read it and I Actually saw it. pretty good. Yeah. yeah, the book is fantastic. Maugham is one of my favorite authors because he writes dialogue so well. Man, that guy understood nuances of personality and human interaction. And in that story, the main character travels to India to try to make sense of his life. And he meets a guru there. And the guru tells him that there are, in his tradition, three paths to enlightenment. There's the path of prayer, there's the path of service, and there's the path of knowledge. He says the path of knowledge is the most difficult of those three paths to attain to enlightenment, but he says it's one of those three paths. But he also says that eventually, as you walk those paths and arrive and approach closer to enlightenment, you realize the three paths are really one. That when you understand who you are and how you are related to every other person and aspect of created reality, how can you not devote more of your time to the service of that understanding? And how is that opportunity not associated with gratitude, which is a form of devotion for the opportunity to be alive? In my comprehension, that's how those three things come to alignment with each other. When you actually understand reality more clearly, it's not even correct that you're serving other people. Like that's more of a perception of ego construction. You understand that the boundaries between self and other or inside and outside are really fluid and actually arbitrarily constructed and enforced. And that knowledge like no one needs to be taught on some level to take care of themselves on, 
on a very basic level. Yeah, we need to be taught how to present ourselves in a specific culture, but like humans are born with inborn tendencies for self-preservation, right? But when you expand the conception of self, then your behavior begins to look more and more like service to others, but it's really not. It's, it's, it's service to a, a higher, more expansive conceptualization of self. Last one. Sure. This is Muhammad Ali. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in a world where they've been given rather than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Yeah. Practically speaking, he's probably correct. He's not correct in a very technical sense when we get down to like axiomatic logic or something like that. He's a boxer. <laughs> he was a smart guy though. No, very smart. Um, he was smart in a lot of different ways. Um, people don't know what impossible is. People don't know what possible is. You'd have to already have omniscience to know that with certainty. And I sure don't have that. And I don't think anybody else I know does. If I examine their behavior, <laughs> their choices as they move through life. So um, saying that something is possible or impossible assumes a position of omniscience, which is arrogant and unjustified. Um, <clears throat> there was something else I was gonna say to this. It almost comes back to the optimism thing that we talked about earlier. especially coming from an athlete. I think you have to be able to, we have this phrase in English, I, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. As if like belief is rationally related to empirical evidence, <laughs> which is run counter to everything we know about human beings. It's more true to say that you have to believe it to see it. On some level, certain mental constructs have to exist in your mind to be able to perceive certain things as objects in reality. Until those concepts or those structures exist in your mind, you don't see them. Like you see them with your eyes, you see them with, you sense them, but you don't perceive them with your mind because there's a difference between sensing and perce perceiving. And perception is always mediated by psychology. So, You need to be able to believe it in order to see it. Otherwise, I mean, I, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't work the other way around. I just know from my personality, I live to achieve the impossible. It motivates me. It inspires me. It makes me come alive. Do you think that it's therefore impossible? No, I think it's possible. I just think it's very unlikely. Ah, I see. Pessimists call it impossible. Hmm. But I know that anything is possible. I don't know if anything is possible. Maybe it is. Maybe it I, is. I don't mean anything. I mean, I'm sure you can, like, you're not going to defy gravity, but. Well, I mean, how do I, another way to approach this is sort of like, what is a miracle? A miracle, I same, guess. Same kind of thing. Is in, a, in the popular understanding, it's something that, that shouldn't be able to to occur. It's like against the laws of nature. It's physically impossible, and yet it is. And there's examples of miracles in the lives of saints and in different religious texts, etc. It's a miracle that Jesus walked on water. It's a miracle that he multiplied the loaves, etc. But to my mind, like that is a very narrow conceptualization of what a miracle is. When you say that the multiplication of the loaves is a miracle, you say it because, well, that shouldn't have been. Like th that, based on my understanding of reality, th that cannot have happened. But like what understanding of reality insists that any of this should have happened? 
that light should have all the colors in it and then be fractured by a prism. Like, why isn't that a miracle? Like, why do you believe that it should just be that way? You know what I'm saying? Why do we not believe that it's a miracle that gravity attracts towards the center of its mass? Like, we just, oh, that's just how it's supposed to be. Like, says who? Like, what's your basis of comparison? And if your basis of comparison is nothingness, like attaining to some conceptualization, if it's possible, of reality that is not only empty, but full of the potential of ever being full of anything, then everything is miraculous. Because in comparison with that standard, nothing should be. Like there's no rational basis for anything. Even the most ordinary aspect of our existence is miraculous. So people who just think that walking on water, it's like, well, is miraculous is missing the point. It's like, why don't we consider that it's a miracle that ice floats? Like most things when they become solid sink. And the fact that ice floats actually is probably related to the persistence of life on this planet more than most people understand because we think that life came out of the, the ocean. And if the oceans cooled and ice sank, it would sink to the bottom, which would freeze another layer of water, which would sink to the bottom. And ultimately, the seas would just potentially be one mass of ice and no life could potentially thrive in that, according to our conceptual, conventional understanding anyway. The point is, is that every aspect of reality that we take for granted is miraculous when viewed in the context of nothingness which might be an appropriate standard of comparison as opposed to our narrow conceptual view, conventional view of reality. That was a little far out, but hopefully. It's okay. You know, life is pretty miraculous. It is. It's, it's completely incomprehensible. Like no one will ever be able to understand life. And that might not be the point. It's pretty fun to be alive. I think it beats the alternative. <laughs> it, it does. All right, Orion, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Mark. This is a fun talk.